the, the most undervalued stock sector in history uh, for, for the miners that is relative to the S&P or relative to the price of gold, the miners are more undervalued. Now, you'll notice about back in mid-February, Stanley Druckenmiller, it was, it was a headline, financial headline, dumped a bunch of big techs. Yeah. Which I'm sure he's smiling about right now because, frankly, they're below where they were then and bought Newmont and Barrick. Michael Oliver, how are you, man? Um, just great. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. And on, on, on the fly, uh, first of all, I'd like to start out with, we had you on uh, just about a month ago, and you had a great call. And you mentioned in that uh, interview that gold and silver were really about to move, and the equities were really about to move. And boy, did they. So let's start with that. Um, they, they exploded out right on your call. So great. Congratulations. And then the questions I'm getting now is, where do we go in from here? What are your in indicators saying? And are we due for a pullback? Because we've just had a heck of a run for the past uh, past month or so. Yeah, you know, we got like what the 10, 11 days in a row of silver up. That's highly unusual. But anyway, uh, what broke out for us was not so much the price action. The price action has repeatedly teased especially gold. You know, you, you made a couple highs, uh, 2020, uh, at the price of 2070. And in 2022, you made a price high at 2070. And then in 2023, you went up above there, but then fell back. So everybody thinks every new high you can sell, you know, it doesn't continue. And then you made another new high and it pulled back a little. So it, it continues to tease people. There's an error among most technicians created by what they've seen for the last three or four years. In other words, when you look at the, the metrics on your computer, you, know, you usually get them free on your quote system, you know, RSI and MACD and Bollinger Bands, et cetera. They measure norms and norms are established over a period of time, you know, maybe over the past several weeks or past several months and so forth. And and, you know, the, the bands get so high and so low and they have a normal breathing pattern in terms of their dimensionality and so forth. But that's established by the activity of, of a given market over a period of time, usually not enough time. So we've had, for example, in gold, if, again, I suggest anybody go get a logarithmic scale to price chart. To forget the arithmetic, logarithmic, go back 50 years, go back to the 1970s. And what you'll see is, the action that we had in 2020 that surged us up over 2000 went into an extremely narrow little range. In fact, the, the actual percent dimensionality from extreme high to low was only 20%. And that was very brief. That was that late 2022 pullback. Generally, it was confined in about a 15% range. Okay. So very sleepy, very high level, but just it went comatose. And so if you build your metrics, your notions of what's overbought, what's oversold, based on what has happened over, let's say, the prior three years, you're being spoon-fed an awfully sedate pattern of behavior. And so you think, well, that's the pattern of behavior. So when it bursts up and gets, quote, overbought, like we have recently, yes, it's overbought by those metrics. But when you go back and look at the dynamics of gold over the years, there's times, you know, it wakes up and it's a monster. And it blows all of your notions of what's overbought, oversold, et cetera, et cetera, out the window. And so I think a lot of even pro-gold people have been teased by this behavior into thinking, oh, we're overbought, we got to pull back. Okay. Same with silver. Uh, anyway, what we broke out above in November for gold and early this month for silver and GDX, GDX actually the close of last month the gold mining ETF, was annual momentum structure. And not, you look at a price chart, and when GDX got up over 31, if you look at a price chart, like two weeks ago, whatever, when we were down there, 30, 31 area, breaking out over this nothing on price. You weren't breaking out over anything. you know. But when you look at annual momentum, that means you measure each month in relation to a three-year average or a 36-month average. There was this box perfectly defined they went back a couple of years, and it wasn't clear at all when you look at a price chart. It was fairly irregular. 
you know, the generally declining behavior since 2020. But on momentum, it was a flat structure where if you looked at the momentum chart, you'd say, oh boy, we got a breakout pending here, you know, and all it took is getting above 31 to suddenly boom, you're 34, you know. Uh, so what we saw when we called that was not a price breakout, it was a momentum breakout. <clears throat> now, context, pardon me if I get long-winded here. <laughs> you're good. Okay, you're fine. When you go back the history of gold and silver, the last 50 years since gold was legalized, you know, in 75. And look at the bull markets that have occurred. And we've repeatedly said this, and it doesn't mean we're predicting this. In fact, we may go way beyond this. But gold's had eight-fold moves three times. So actually six to seven-fold between early 1970 and 1975. And then when you measure from the 1976 corrective low to the 1980 peak, it was an eight-fold. And when you measure from the breakout around the $250 level up to 1920, between 2000 and 2011, that was an eightfold. Okay. Right now, gold's a little more than a double off of its last it's barrel up. You know, so, I mean, you say, oh, well, it looks good on a price chart, but it's actually small compared to those bull markets in terms of percentage gain. Okay. Go back and look at those bull markets again, especially look at 79 to 80, the last year of that bull market that peaked in 80. Go look at uh, 2010 to 2011, the last year of the silver gold bull market that peaked in 2011. Look what happened in the last year of those already aged bull trends. Explosion, specific. I just, I just looked it up myself, get the numbers right. To in January of 1979 and January of 80, gold went up three and a half fold, three and a half times its price, okay? Silver went up seven and a half fold in that last year, okay? Beat the pants off of gold, finally. During that whole bull market, silver had sort of matched and, you know, it was a little more anemic than gold from time to time. Didn't wasn't really dynamic. But in that last year, it left the earth. Okay. Again, 2010 to 2011, the last year, that big bull market. Gold didn't even double, almost double, but not quite. Okay. And the last year of that bull market now. And silver tripled. So again, silver beat the pants off of gold in the last year of the move. And much of the net price gain in both those bull trends came in the last year. Well, right. now we, we're, we're eight years old, okay? Mm -hmm. 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 1, 2, 3, 4. No, I'm sorry. We're in the ninth year right now, okay? So we've got a fairly aged bull trend, but it hasn't matched the dimensions of prior ones. Those guys did it in the last year. A lot of it occurred then. What if in the next year, and we think this is going to happen, by the way, not because of that historical pattern, some other reasons, that we're going to lift off. So what you've just seen is not some irregularity. It's the start of, of the dynamic phase of the bull market, where, you know, if gold goes eightfold, it goes 8,000, you know, and that's just matching the, the dynamics of the logarithmic moves that occurred 75, 1980, 2011. Now, we know we have fundamentals out there that are far more dynamic and earth-shaking than any time before in terms of what the hell's going on in these other big asset categories. And I think that's going to help drive gold uh, at least to match that old dynamic of the, the percent scale, you know, the $8,000 gold. Then the issue is, okay, well, what about silver? Uh, silver, if you look at a ratio chart, where you divide the price of silver into the price of gold. Right now, it's about 1.9%, which is very low. Okay. Which is an ounce of silver, an ounce of gold. Okay. You go back and look over the last 50 years, you'll find one time, we'll, we'll exempt it, where it was 6.5% of the price of gold. But there were many times in there, half a dozen or so, where silver went up to about 25 to 3% or more of the price of gold. Almost routinely, it wasn't an exception. Gosh, if we go to 3% of the price of gold, even at the current price, imagine where silver would be. What if gold goes up a normal eight-fold move? And silver, you know, $8,000 gold and, and silver's a 3% of you, you know, hundreds of dollars. Okay, okay. Forget that. But what happened in that last year of those bull markets was certain momentum factors built up, compression, where just right. like triggered now, where suddenly you get a launch. 
our expectation is this, and it will change if we have a reason to, but I don't think we're going to. Over the next six, five to six months, we're going to see parabolic moves in gold and silver. And it wouldn't shock me that silver is way, way, way beyond $50 at that point. Uh, however, if you go back and examine those, that last couple quarters of advance in the bull markets, there's often a month in there where if you're long, they scare you. Which you may get a six-month thunderbolt, but in there, somewhere in the middle of that is a point where everybody says, oh, it's all over, okay? We know, you know, that has to happen, okay? So we're fully expecting a correction at some point, but we're very early in this launch phase. In fact, we're in the second week of the launch phase. So you get us into, you know, in the summer, we might be looking a little more closely for a corrective sharp pullback but not a sustainable one, just a breather. So anyway, dynamics are here. That's what we think. Yeah, you really alluded to that, in, uh, and I'm a subscriber and one of your clients. You really alluded to that in one of your reports you sent out recently. And I guess to summarize this, you really, if you believe this move to be real, which I do and you do, um, you really want to be long silver because you're going to, that's really going to be your leverage in relationship to gold, correct? Correct. And the miners as well. I would pound the table over the miners right now. Yeah. And the miners. Well, and I remember an interview you did in December, and then you just reiterated that recently in, um, in February, just the fundamentals, the value of the miners, but then the charts and all of your indicators were really setting up a play on the miners. And they, they certainly did, they certainly did explode. I think though the one of the biggest things keys that you you bring up and other people have brought this up too, and it's also been my experiences in the last stages, if you would, and people and that's not a negative. I hope people understand that, but in the last stages is where you get the parabolic crazy moves, and your thesis and it's supported by the science is that's where I'm correct. Yeah, uh, the miners are. The most, our assessment is the most undervalued stock sector in history for the miners. That is relative to the S&P or relative to the price of gold, the miners are more undervalued. Now, you'll notice about back in mid-February, Stanley Druckenmiller, it was, it was a headline, financial headline, dumped a bunch of big techs, yeah. which I'm sure he's smiling about right now because, frankly, they're below where they were then and bought Newmont and Barrick. And at that mm. point in time, if you looked at Newmont, for example, the biggest gold miner in the world, it was about $31. Right now it's 40, okay? Yep. So I'm gonna make a bet that many of the portfolio managers around Wall Street at that time chuckled and smirked when they saw the headlines and said, what a dummy, you know? And now, you know, he's up, uh, you know, from 30 to 40, okay, in, in weeks, okay? And, and they're wondering about their positions because they're enamored of the, you know, the limited, uh, highly limited, narrow bull market in stocks. Uh, I think he made a, a good decision. And as some other guys followed him shortly thereafter. I forgot their names, but I saw the little headlines. I think as you shake the stock market a little bit more, and we already think it started to decline, our intermediate trend factors say that was probably the top. Okay. Question is, what when you go down, do you break and break layers of structure on momentum that cause it to go even deeper, which we will, but you do it in phases. But as that starts to occur, portfolio managers have to find a place to be, you know, and if they look at their, their orthodoxy of 60% stocks, 40% bonds, you know, the portfolio perfect, you know, et cetera. Well, you got killed with that portfolio in 2022 because everything went down big. Bonds were down even more than stocks. Okay. Right. Now, lately, there's start, started to be a divorce between the bonds and the stock market to some extent. But right now, no. Uh, the bonds are, you know, they're scary. I'm talking U.S. government 30-year T-bond futures. Um, I'm sure the Fed is wetting their pants over what's going on in that market because they don't control that market like they do the short end of the market. That long right. is a bit out of their control, and it's not behaving uh, righteously. Okay, and it's the kind of thing they can't speak up and say, "Oh, we're very concerned about." It. They have to continue their talk about well, inflation. You know, 
as they measure it, which is a silly way to measure it anyway. Uh, inflation is very broad. It's not just commodities or CPI. Stocks get inflated too. You know, 2009 to 2022 was a 18-fold move in the NASDAQ, you know, and they printed it up there. Go right. look at money supply. Okay. But they can't admit that, but they're really in a pickle now because they've got the two mandates. Now, right now, the unemployment really has been not good. They, they claim it's been good, but if you look at it carefully, it's been horrible because it's been mostly part-time jobs, mostly government and home care workers and mm -hmm. hospitality workers, and not the elements of the economy, the segments of the economy that are industrial and so forth. You know, they've yeah. been down. So for three months now, we've not had good employment numbers, and yet they can't admit that. Yeah. But when that starts to go negative, when the stock market starts to break, that's usually when those data points will shift and you'll start to see the unemployment. Then they're going to have a problem because, one, we think commodities are starting their second major up leg, which is going yeah, to Yeah, you mentioned that in yeah. your report. Do you yeah. uh, the Bloomberg Commodity Index is right now at breakout levels such that it says the pullback we've seen since that war began in Ukraine and Russia, which is when they peaked, by the way, um, right. is over and we're starting back up again. Well, that's just what the Fed needs because then right. that's going to create pressure on the one mandate contrary to possible pressure on the other mandate to go the other way. So they, they'd be schizo. You know, what do we yeah. do? <laughs> anyway, gold knows this, I think. Gold knows that there is a massive paper asset bubble, biggest in U.S. stock market history, that is going to break. In fact, by our metrics, it already signaled that it was going to break in early 2022. It's residual new highs and a few indexes doesn't change that. We think once that becomes evident, that's when the central banks of the world, and already EU today, ECB said uh, they're probably going to soften soon, despite what the Fed said. So we, uh, anyway, we think when that, those policies do shift, gold knows this was going to happen, right. it, that the paper asset bubble would break. And when it did, central banks would have to do what they do all the time, print, print, print. That's why gold did what it did over the last few years. Got it. And it's interesting too, just watching it, it seems like there's just some very strong hands buying, if you would, buying yeah. gold and silver, very strong hand. So, well, to big uh, governments too, you know, uh, everybody yeah, with the US banks. basically. Yeah. 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 Central yeah. banks. Well, Michael, um, for our listeners, you already alluded this to your uh, clients and subscribers, which I'm a very proud one of that. That's why I wanted to talk to you. You've had some just some phenomenal calls. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and just thank you so much for coming on. How can people who've never heard about you, how can people find you? And uh, yeah, tell us, tell us how people can get in touch with you. So it's Oliver MSA for Momentum Structural Analysis, OliverMSA.com. Visit the site, learn about our method. Got archival reports there where we've called major tops and bottoms in the stock market, for example. And, and request some samples. Yeah. Happy Absolutely. I'll put all this in the show notes. And again, I'm a very proud supporter and a client of yours. And thank you for all that you've done. Thank done you, Andy. Me. You bet. Thank you. See you Bye -bye. again. Bye-bye. Yeah.